In this video, I'm going to talk through the geometries of refraction and how our refractometers are set up, why they're set up the way they are. We're going to be looking at various of the apertures and the effect that they have on heat change and so on. I'm going to be focusing on a couple of geometries, uh, such as bright red and the transmission mode. Uh, in a separate video at a later time, I will cover uh, non coupled geometries, such as those required for phrasing incidence work or residual strain analysis. So the picture here shows the inside of our new liquid E2 phasing benchmark XR machine. You can see the left hand side we have our X-ray source. This is firing a beam of X-rays onto the sample. The sample here is actually shown in the retracted lower position. Normally during an experiment it would be up at the, the, the blue light effectively. Diffracting X-rays up to the right into our X-ray detector. The whole central contraption where all the gearing is and so on. It, we tend to call the goniometer, sometimes a goniostat, but usually goniometer. We can see that this is built around the principle of the diffraction circle. This is often called uh, bright Brentano geometry, and sometimes it's called uh, reflection geometry. You can see why. So our X-ray source up to the left, firing X-rays X -rays through some apertures um, onto the sample, which is then reflected in the detector or into brightly later. So in this video, we're going to be looking at various of these apertures and what they do. What's key about this though, uh, just looking at this basic uh, schematic here, is that the sample surface is in a very specific position. It's the top of the sample surface should be on the diffraction circle. So if you took a point right at the center of the sample, right at the top, that, that should be on the center of the diffraction circle. It should be self-evident to you what would happen if the sample was instead shifted to a higher position. It would intercept those uh, x-rays coming in from the source sooner, effectively, and diffract them at a higher angle. And this is the cause of the so-called specimen height displacement error. Specimen height displacement is by far the most common source of error in x-ray refraction experiments. And it's easily avoidable. Put the sample at the right place, you shouldn't see a significant specimen height displacement. The shift in peak position that results from specimen height displacements is given by the equation on the, on the middle right here. And what you can see in the graph is effectively five different uh, shifts in peak positions according to different specimen height displacements. And these are only very small values, so we're talking uh, fractions of millimeters, and we're seeing an observable effect. So these would all be shifts of one or two data points to higher or lower positions across the diffraction pattern. And that can make your life and your analysis of your X-ray data an awful lot harder than you think. And it's something that's always within your control to avoid. So it's really important to try and avoid that. Put yourself in the right place. The diffraction circle idea is built around a uh, sort of parafocusing condition. If we imagine we've got our X-rays coming from the source S onto a powder specimen located on the RAB. Um, X-rays hitting points A, points B, will scatter through the same angle to converge and focus at point F. So we would get perfect focusing if we have a curved specimen. So all the bits in between A and B would also be um, focusing onto point F. Obviously for most samples, I mean, you would think that would be very difficult, and it's not possible. Um, so in diffraction experiments, we tend to use flat point specimens. So the sample is flat, which results in a slightly a slight deviation from the true focusing condition. So effectively, the outside parts of the sample are lower than the diffraction circle, and so we would see the peaks shifting systematically to slightly lower angles, what we call a flat plane specimen error. So if we go through some of these apertures and look at what they do as well, uh, first up is the solar slits. You can see we have these on both sides of the machine. Um, and effectively, we can divide the machine up into primary secondary sides. So the primary side is the pre-sample, so between the source and the sample, and the secondary post-sample, or that's uh, between the sample and the detector. The solar slits typically lie in both positions. Solar slits are thin, parallel, equally spaced metal plates, uh, often made from metal, uh, from the lift on foil. You can see the slits here for the E2 machine, so you can see what we're talking about. Basically, these make sure that only X-rays traveling in a certain direction can reach the sample. 
So we're going to limit the divergence uh, along the axial, uh, the goniometer axis. <coughs> so what you can see from the diagrams up on the right hand side, um, X-rays traveling to the center of the sample are going to have a much shorter path than those traveling towards the outside there because they're diverging away from the uh, goniometer axis. And so by putting solar slits in there, we can limit that goniometer that uh, axial divergence. You can see the equation on the left hand side is defining um, the axial divergence according to the size and uh, spacing of the solar slits. And basically, the longer the slits or the more narrowly placed they are, or the, the narrower the uh, distance between plates, um, the lower that divergence angle will be. And you can see a graph here showing the effect of that sort of divergence. So you can see for bigger uh, solar slits, uh, so uh, having a greater space or a shorter length, so we get more axial divergence, you can see this real asymmetry on the, on the low angle side. Um, particularly, this is evident in uh, low angle reflections as well, sometimes called the umbrella effect. Uh, you can see it's a real broadening. So if you had any extra peaks that were at these lower um, positions, you might not see them due to the axial divergence. So the solar slits act to really tidy up uh, apertures. We've then got other apertures, divergence slit, primary side, and on the secondary side we have uh, scatter slits and receiving slits. Uh, the divergence slits suppress divergence in the plate of the battery. Uh, so that effectively they're going to control the size of the footprint of the X-ray being onto the sample. Uh, and by using smaller divergence slits, we're going to reduce the effect of that flat plate specimen element. We're going to be looking only at those parts that are closer to the, to the uh, diffraction circle. Um, so <clears throat> we can define um, two illuminated areas. If we imagine a point in the center of the sample, we can see the total illumination uh, is made up of two components, that lying between the source and the center of the sample, L1, and L2 lying between the center of the sample, the source, and the, sorry, the detector. The graph on the right plots um, L1 and L2 distances for four very common um, phi settings. So these are different slit sizes. So we can use a two degree slit, one degree slit, half a degree or a quarter of a degree. We can see what the results would be here. So the take home message here is that if you had a peak at 20 degrees two theta, most machines have a one degree divergence slit. So you can see at 20 degrees, L2 would be about 15 millimeters and L1 would be about 13 millimeters. So that means the total area of the X-ray footprint from left to right across the machine would be around about 28 millimeters. That explains why we need such big samples for X-ray diffraction uh, in bright photonic geometry. If you had a very small sample, you could try and decrease the size of these slits, and you can see if you move down to half a degree slits then the total illuminated area is going to be around about 14, 15 millimeters, or 20 degrees to theta. So it'll be a lot smaller. But for a broken tunnel geometry, bigger is always better in terms of samples. Secondary slits, we usually have a scatter slit, which makes sure only the beams getting diffracted from the sample reach the detector, so we're not getting um, beams coming from elsewhere in the machine. And also we've got the receiving slit. This is placed at focal point and it defines the resolution of the instrument, how well closely spaced the flexions can be separated. Note the design is exactly the same as divergence slit. Uh, final thing that we can look at is the K-beta filter and we've covered these already. Uh, they tend to be exactly the same design as the slits we just looked at but with a piece of metal foil and uh, we looked at those in the last video. Another component we should talk about at this stage are monochromators. Uh, monochromator comes from the Greek with one color, and it's a device for selecting the radiation of a single event. There are two different types that we have available in the production lab here. Uh, diffractive beam monochromators fitted to all our E5000 instruments, and these remove K beta radiation, suppress background and fluorescence, uh, so they really tidy up uh, our data. They don't separate out K-alpha-1 and K-alpha-2 radiation, so you still have both of those wavelengths present. 
but you do get rid of most of the K-beta, uh, if not all of it effectively. Um, and if you're looking at a sample that's, for example, iron rich like steel, this would fluoresce with copper radiation. The K-beta filter will get rid of that fluorescence, as will um, a refractive beam mono filter. So absolutely essential. The secondary beam monos like this tend to be a little bit more effective than a K-beta filter, so uh, they, they tend to be preferred. We could also put the monochromator in front of the uh, sample, so have it on the primary side, and this would then mean we would remove the K-beta and the K-alpha-2 radiation, so we get quite a clean uh, K-alpha-1 um, spectrum coming in front of the sample. And we'll suppress the background, but obviously if you have any sample effects like iron in the sample fluorescing with copper radiation, you would still see those effects uh, in the data. So these, mach these machines, like the Stoeys that have primary beam monochromators, tend to be very good for the high resolution work and for structural analysis using the repair method. You can see the effect here of the refractive beam monochromator. It's a titanium nitrate sample with and without the monochromator and the refractive beam site. And so you can see uh, in red, without the monochromator, you have quite a noisy pattern and lots of. Um, Bits in the diffraction pattern hiding in the background that look like it might be peaks, they might not be peaks, it's not very clear. But if we put in a secondary beam mono, we tidy it up a lot. So it's a lot more apparent um, what is and is not a peak, and also the background is much lower. So diffracted beam monochromator would come here on, just before the detector on the secondary side. Um, and as I say, all of our D5000s are fitted with secondary beam monos as standard, and they work to um, reduce fluorescence in the background. And they basically mean you can run any sample on any of our machines. <clears throat> For a primary beam mono, um, works according to Bragg's law, which we'll come to later on in another video. Uh, but basically, it's going to um, come on the primary side, take a polychromatic beam from the X ray source, and open it up into a spectrum. And by putting the slits in specific places, we can select a specific wavelength to hit that sample. So we get a relatively monochromatic beam. How monochromatic it is depends on the quality of the crystal, so any defects, distortions, stresses, and so on will um, uh, cause the, the beam produced to be less monochromatic. But in general, especially with our studies, we do get a very clean, uh, careful look. Um, you can see here we're showing a um, sample in transmission mode. Um, so this is as it would be on our study machines. Um, and you can imagine, after what we've talked about for absorption uh, of X rays, that the sample thickness is going to be really crucial here. So if the sample is too thick, the beam won't actually you won't see anything in the detector. We also have the option of the by shower geometry. This is where um, we have the sample as a powder, and it has to be a powder, mounted inside a glass container. We'll look more later at what preferred orientation is, but suffice to say for now, if you do have preferred orientation in your sample, running in device shared geometry is the best way to get that done. So, hopefully, this short video has given you a good idea for the different types of experimental setup that we have here in the XRD research facility, and also some of the more common aberrations that cause headaches when it comes to your data analysis. I'm giving you some advice on how to avoid